Full offseason time for Duke basketball. A lot of roster decisions set to be made. And let's still take a look back at what the 2023-2024 season was for John Shire. Our good pal, Brendan Marks, on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils. Your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. So great to have you here with us on Thursday, April 11th, 2024. Lockdown Blue Devils, of course, is your one stop shop for everything going on in the life of Duke athletics. You know that we talk a lot of Duke basketball day in and day out, and that's going to be the conversation once again here today. Do want to give some more love, though, as we talk throughout the spring to the Duke baseball team who stands atop the ACC. Once again, and how about that Duke softball team? First time ever that Duke softball ranked number one in the country, according to those folks at Softball America. So keeping our tabs on that in the days and weeks to come. But again, a lot of basketball being discussed today with our good pal Brendan Marks of The Athletic. If you have not done so already, please be sure to follow and subscribe to Locked On Blue Devils for free wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Also make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the show each and every day. Leave us a five-star rating and written review. Follow us on X at LO underscore Blue Devils. And I'm there as well at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. Without further ado, excited to bring him on in. It's our good friend Brendan Marks of The Athletic back once again. We've reached the end of the college basketball season. No more ball set to be played. We know it's the end because the Final Four always leads into Masters Week. Here we are on Masters Thursday, getting teed up, so to speak. And so uh, happy to tee up another conversation with you, Brendan. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, it's it's wild. Uh, the way the season used to work, we'd be done right now. And uh, <laughs> instead, this is only the beginning of the second season of the offseason. So plenty still to discuss. Without a doubt. A lot to keep up with and keep track of. As already, we're looking ahead to what next year could be like. But I said, I want to pause a moment. I, I need to put into context what this year was for the Duke basketball program, and who better to ask that question to than you, Brendan? So if you were to give some context to the second year of the John Shire era or a, a brief summary, what are those big things that really stand out to you? Yeah, you know, I, I've heard a lot of, uh, especially after the way the season ended, heard a lot of uh, Duke fans very vocally upset with this season. But to me... It tends I, to happen, doesn't it? <laughs> it does tend to happen that way. The way I look at it, though, you know, I, I think for John Shire now, you know, you got to put it in the context of two years and basically starting from scratch when he came in, like, uh, yes, he had the nation's number one recruiting class coming in, but still freshman. Um, and as we've learned, it's it's hard to win with freshmen, especially in today's era. College basketball has never been older. In two years, you've now got an ACC tournament title. You've got an Elite Eight. You've got two teams that have each won 27 games. Um, I think where I've basically sort of settled on this season being is I think that it was a successful season because obviously you make the Elite Eight. You're, you know, in, in Duke's case, you were 20 minutes away from making it to the Final Four. Um but at the same time, I can understand why people think that it was underwhelming, you know, given the preseason expectations, given the fact that you had four starters back, um, you know, projected to win the ACC, projected as the number one team in the country in the preseason and to not win the ACC regular season and to have had the opportunity to not win the ACC tournament title and then obviously to not make the final four. I can understand why some people look at that as underwhelming. So I think it can be both those things simultaneously successful and also leave you wanting more. Um, and at a program like Duke, that's kind of how it always is. If it's not a national championship, people are always wanting more. But listen, like I think, you know, I've heard some people questioning John Shire and whether he's like the long term guy. And that's we it, those people and I do not exist on the same planet. I, I could I don't think that's any clearer that John is the guy, um, even though ultimately they came up 20 minutes short of the final four. Yeah, season that was another 27 and nine overall record for Shire, as you alluded to, a trip to the Elite Eight, one and done in the ACC tournament, but still a whole lot to recognize and highlight. I think it's interesting to go back to preseason conversations that you and I had to where we're at now. So, just one more time before we really uh, start to look at what could be next for the Stoop team, 
the team that was in 2023, 2024, when you're watching them play down the stretch, what were those big strengths of this Duke basketball team? Yeah, you know, I, I think obviously you have to talk about um, the stylistic change that John made, you know, and obviously going from having Derek Lively as the center of everything last year, um, by the end of the season, he was the most important player Duke had. And then to completely reverse course and go three out, uh, you know, three guards primarily most of the time, go to a five out offense almost, you know, 100% of the time. Um I think that that really shows how malleable John is and the fact that he doesn't necessarily need guys to fit into specific holes. He's willing to fit his system around the pieces that he has on any given roster. And I think that that's important, especially for a young coach. Um, you know, there are some guys who come in and they say, this is my system and I need a wing who looks like this. I need a point guard who looks like this. I need a center who looks like this. Um, and John hasn't really shown that through the two seasons. He's been willing to adapt and bend. And I think that's the good thing. Um, the biggest thing to me is that when we go back to some of those preseason conversations that you and I had, you know, I think one of the biggest questions and a question that, you know, ended up really being one of the reasons why Duke's season ended the way it did. Um, Duke did not have an answer at the center position basically all season. And we were afraid of that in the preseason. Um, you know, Kyle Filipowski had another all ACC campaign, borderline all American season. He is not a conventional five. He's not a conventional rim protector. He's not a conventional rebounding big guy. And especially, like I mentioned, in the Elite Eight game in the second half against NC State, um, that's that's really where, where Duke was able to be taken advantage of. So um, it's interesting looking at something that was perceived as a flaw, how Duke was able to sort of make it work throughout most of the regular season. But when push came to shove, something we were afraid of ultimately came back. So um, it's just important to remember that going into next season, what we appear to know, uh, things can always change, but it is important to realize like, you know, in the off season, we have these expectations for a good reason. Yeah. And in, in a lot of ways, strengths and weaknesses off or preseason to now ended up being the same a couple of surprises along the way and so much more. So still talking about this past season's team and uh, reading your work for as long as I have. And I know certainly others as well. It's very clear. You care about people and their stories and being able to bring that to light and share them. Been a really fun year for you, as you've even talked about with listeners here on the program, kind of expanding just beyond Duke and North Carolina. But we know geographically where you're located. It's really hard for you to, you know, live under a rock and not see what's taking place with these programs. So with Duke this past season, the people themselves on the team, stories or their character, what like what did you enjoy about this Duke particular team covering the season? Yeah, you know, number one, um, and I, I you know, I'm just kind of adding to the choir here, but like I don't know that I've ever covered an athlete like Jared McCain before. Yeah. Um, you know, just personality wise, like especially like I I I wish I had his personality now. I'm not, not, I was going to say I wish I had it when I was his age, but I wish I had it now. I mean, the dude is eternally optimistic. And, um, you know, even after some of the tough losses, like the maturity, the accountability, like just an awesome, awesome person. Um, you know, maybe he'll be back next season. I'm, I'm doubtful. We'll get into that. But um, just really cool to be able to cover somebody like that. Um, somebody who like very clearly just loves what they do very clearly wants to get better. Um, had a great relationship, has a great relationship with his brother. His brother kind of does everything for Jared. Um, so it was just really cool just to be around that obviously. And then for me, like, you know, the other coolest thing in this job and the thing that we don't get to do as much of anymore is covering guys who stick around and seeing the growth. And like, I remember Jeremy Roach as a freshman and we're, you know, talking to him on that, that, you know, basically the worst Duke team of the modern era, the worst team since 95. Like anytime there's a bad Duke season, it's since 95. Um, and he was part of that. You know, he was brought in as a five-star guy and really struggled early. And to see him go from that to final four hero to, you know, the captain um, bridging the two eras. And then obviously this season, in my opinion, being Duke's most dependable player the entire year. Um just seeing how Jeremy Roach has grown up is a really cool thing. And, you know, maybe he'll be back next year. Again, he's still got the extra year of code eligibility. Um, but I love, you know, it's at, at any school I cover, when you can see a guy come in as a high schooler, stick around and grow and grow as a player and a person, it's a really cool thing to see. No doubt. You've kind of alluded to some of the big decisions coming up next year. Let's quit teasing people. Let's get to that. Uh, and we'll do that after we take our first time out here on today's episode of Lockdown Blue Devils, Brendan Marks of The Athletic, hanging out and spending some time with us here today. 
All right, Locked On Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Game Time, of course, is the ticketing place that we love. It's now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball. Getting started right now it makes getting tickets even faster and easier than previously. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer that it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. They've also got great tickets for other sports, concerts, comedy, theater events, and so much more. You could save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Save even more when you choose a section and let the Game Time app choose the seats for you. Toggling feature shows a total upfront, so there are no surprise fees at checkout. You get to know that all up front before you even get started. And again, you gotta love the seat views that are there, a panoramic shot of a view from your seat in the app before you buy. That's absolutely one of my favorite things to do. You kind of want to know what to expect, and Game Time lets you do that. Once again, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. For $20 off. Promo code locked on college for $20 off when you download the Game Time app. Download the app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Really excited here on Lockdown Blue Devils to be joined once again today by our pal Brendan Marks of The Athletic. We're talking everything about the end of the Stuke basketball season. And we said it a moment ago, we've been talking a lot about what's next for the Stuke team. The transfer portal is a buzz. NBA draft declarations set to take place uh, later today. Duke's expected to have their kind of annual end of year banquet. Well, they'll get the whole team together and discuss uh, the season that was. So with that being said, we know that Christian Reeves and Mark Mitchell have now entered the transfer portal. Where do you look to next? What's the next big domino that could go off that kind of has a chain reaction amongst the next of this roster as you look to the next season? Yeah, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily one big one because there's so many. I mean, there's there are, you know, comparatively last year, Duke doesn't have a single guy go in the portal. That is not going to be the case this season, obviously. It's not, and, and I don't expect that to be the case moving forward. I mean, it was kind of an anomaly, the number of guys John Shire brought in last year and was able to keep them all. Um, but there's a number of other guys who are going to be going in the portal here um, in the next couple of days, weeks, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's also going to be guys who declare. There's going to be guys who declare and maintain their eligibility to see if they could come back. Um, you know, to me, I, I think sort of the, the next ones are the inevitable ones. Like I'm, I'm expecting Sean Stewart to be one of those guys who goes and jumps in the portal. Um, I think that he's somebody who obviously has the pedigree, five star, has all the athleticism. When you look at Duke's roster construction next year, there really isn't a tremendous path to playing time for him. Um, you know, similarly to Mark Mitchell, like I think, you know, for Mark Mitchell, I don't know that his decision to go in the portal was as much about positional overlap as it was of skill overlap. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you assume that Cooper flag and come on mall walk are going to be starting next year at the four and the five, maybe Cooper plays some three. He's going to be a de facto point guard anyways. Um, but with those guys on the floor, while both of them can shoot, I wouldn't say that either of them is necessarily a knockdown sharpshooter. Um, that neither of them is Jared McCain. Uh, and so if you have those two guys on the floor for as much as they're going to be on the floor alongside somebody like Mark Mitchell, now you're suddenly talking about, you know, three relative non shooters. Um, and as we've seen in modern college basketball, that just, just does not, it doesn't work. It's not good enough. Um, so I think for Mark, he sort of saw the writing on the wall there and understands it. But so for me, you know, again, it's a similar situation with Sean Stewart. Those guys are going to be on the floor a lot. I don't know how much of a pathway there is. Um, and to me, the situation that I'm most interested in and probably most uncertain about is, is what happens with the guards. You look at next year's roster, who is the point guard for next year's team? Um, and the answer to that question, I think, determines, you know, what the ceiling can be for John Shire's 13. Yeah, I mean, guard play is obviously so paramount and so important. You feel like you get a big boost last season with Proctor and Roach returning, knowing that you've got Foster and McCain coming in. Let's kind of talk about those guards individually then there. Jared McCain was such a joy to watch all season long. He can shoot the absolute hell out of the basketball. So fun to watch him 
kind of heat up and get going throughout the course of a game. Is now the time to head off to the league and start that next chapter of his career? What does that look like for McCain? I think it probably is. I will say, I think he probably more than anybody else on this roster is going to be a test of Duke's NIL buoyancy. Um, you know, if Jared McCain decides that he wants to go professional and enter the NBA draft, and I think that that is probably the most likely outcome here, um, he's going to be a first round pick. Uh, the shooting, obviously, the rebounding for his size has been really impressive. Um, what he did in the NCAA tournament, just in talking to a couple of scouts, talking to a couple of agents, a couple of other coaches at the Final Four, um, that was really impressive to them. The way that he was able to score the ball that he was against the caliber of teams that Duke was playing. And he earned himself some money during the NCAA tournament, for sure. I'd say he's he's probably Duke's biggest winner of the NCAA tournament, actually. Um, so I would be surprised if he was not back. However, again, like I said... Um, I do think this is a thing where it's kind of going to be a test of Duke's NIL situation. I don't think it's inevitable that he goes. Um, obviously, loves being in college, loves being at Duke, um, is handsomely compensated already from an NIL perspective, probably you know as much, yeah. if not more, than anybody else on Duke's roster. Um, and I think that Jared has a skill set. You know, uh, 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 someone with a UNC lens mentioned it to me the other day and said he's kind of like Tyler Hansborough was it back in the day. You know, you knew he was going to get a shot at some point, and what was he going to do to necessarily change that? I mean, if Jared McCain shoots 47% from three next year on the same volume, that's a different question, but people know what he is. He's a great shooter. He's a really good rebounder for his size. He's somebody who doesn't necessarily have the ton of athleticism. Um, he's, not, he's not like he's not bouncy, but he's not to the same extent as some other guys, and he's improving as a defender, but he's not quite there yet. doesn't necessarily create for himself, so... I'm expecting him to be gone, but I don't think it is a certainty that he is gone. Um, especially if Duke can put together an attractive enough NIL package, I think that would be an interesting thing because he he is the guy from this year's roster who would fit perfectly around the pieces John has coming in next season. He is eternally optimistic, but it's probably safe to say a growth spurt is also not in his horizon. You know, some of those bigger things that can change your outlook as a professional basketball player. But um, excited to see whatever's next for Roach or McCain, excuse me. Speaking of Jeremy Roach, though, he does have that COVID year of eligibility. Uh, a lot of people wondering what the next step is for him. Uh, where does he kind of fit into this equation for Duke? If I'm John Shire, Jeremy Roach is the guy I want back the most. Um, in the final four, there was one five-star player, one former five-star player. He played for UConn, Stefan Castle, and he was essentially his team's fourth or fifth option. Um, he was not the end all be all. What you saw in the final four was every team had elite guard play. Every single team had elite guard play. Even Purdue who struggled and ultimately came up short. Yeah. Uh, Braden Smith was an all big 10 guard. To me, Jeremy Roach is the guy who kind of completes the puzzle for Duke next year. He brings experience. He brings shooting. He brings somebody who's been there before. Uh, he can set other guys up. I think Jeremy Roach, to me, is going to be most valuable next season in Durham. He's probably not going to be drafted. Uh, would have an opportunity in summer league. Maybe ends up getting a two-way. But has an opportunity, if he comes back, to be the anchor of another Final Four team and to really kind of cement himself as one of the all-time Duke winners. And, um, and again, uh, just from a pure monetary value thing, he's going to be as valuable in Durham as he is anywhere next season. All right, and then we're talking about guards as well. There's Tyrese Proctor. There's Caleb Foster. Proctor, two years completed, uh, ended on uh, not how you wanted to see a uh, season end, not scoring, not making a shot in his final game of the season there against NC State. Had some highs and lows throughout the season, but there's still no denying the talent that you see there in Tyrese Proctor. How would he factor into next year's team, I guess, is – how I'll frame this first, and then ultimately, how likely will that happen? Well, you know, I, I think the fact that Tyrese Proctor, you know, he he's the guy, let me preface by saying, I have the least certainty in what he will end up doing um, of anyone on the roster. He's the guy who I feel could go any number of ways. Yeah. He could, Seriously, I mean, he could, he could try to go pro. Um, if he went pro, he may be a second-round pick just because of the age and the upside. He might not be picked at all. Um, he's also a guy who could potentially look elsewhere, see if there's somewhere else. Um, he's also a guy who potentially, you know, is there a situation where kind of like Bobby Clintman last year from Mike Forrest, for him going back home, if he goes to the NBL, becomes a professional, he succeeded there previously when he was younger. Could that be an option for him? Um, and then obviously coming back, 
I mean, I think if he comes back, it's with the understanding that you're bringing experience. You have to bring shooting, um, but you're not necessarily going to be the straw that stirs the drink next season. And we saw that this year and, and part of, in part because of injuries, he was not the guy, even when he was healthy, he was sometimes coming off the bench. Um, and again, as you mentioned, struggled in the biggest game of the season when Duke needed him the most. And that's something that matters. So I have the least certainty about Tyrese Proctor. Um, you know, if I had to make a call right now, and this could, you know, be invalid 20 minutes after we end up posting this thing, but, um, I would be surprised if he was back. Um, but again, anything's possible, but you got to understand, like, you know, he, he is a setup man, but there are enough, enough ways that Tyrese Proctor did not come through for Duke this year that I think John Shire fairly or not has to, has to have a hard conversation and say, look, are you the guy who can be the, the floor general for a national championship team? Um, I think Jeremy Roach has shown that potential. I think Jeremy Roach did it two seasons ago. Tyrese Proctor, I think it's a little bit of a different question. And I like Tyrese a lot. He's be by the end of the season, he was probably Duke's best def perimeter defender again. Um, if I had to guess now, I would say he's probably gone. But again, I say that through the lens of I have the least certainty in what he's going to do of anyone on the roster. Yeah, we, we obviously know the size is excellent for Tyrese Proctor at that position. The shot making, um, you see it. You see the glimpses and how good this guy can be. The outside shooting is terrific, but it was put into context for me. Proctor played 300 more minutes of basketball than Caleb Foster, Brendan, and only attempted one more free throw. Pretty crazy that uh, just going to the rim and kind of trying to finish with that size uh, wasn't happening for whatever reason for Proctor. Yeah, and you know, one of my, I don't know, it, it, Duke fans are probably not going to think it's so great, but I one of my favorite stats for the season was up until I believe it was early, maybe in the middle of February, Tyrese Proctor had not even attempted a transition two pointer, had not even attempted one, wow. not even made one, hadn't attempted one. Um, you know, every transition opportunity he got, he was either dishing it to somebody else or he was pulling up for one of those transition threes that quite frankly, Jared McCain should have been taking. Um, he, he was, you know, one of the best transition three point shooters in the entire country this season. So it's tough for Tyrese because the upside is still there. And you saw what he did two years ago in the NCAA tournament versus Tennessee. He was the only guy who could do much of anything. Um, I think the injuries hurt him this year. I think some of that led to some inconsistency. Um, he did come around towards the end of the year, but at, at the end of the day with Tyrese, um, you know, you talk about getting to the rim, especially he's not a guy who can beat somebody one-on-one -on -one off the dribble. He can't blow by you. And Jared McCain couldn't really do that either this year. Jeremy Rhodes was probably the only guard who could. Um, and so for Tyrese, that ends up, you end up taking a lot more tougher mid range twos and a lot more tough jump shots than you probably would like to. So it's a, it's a tough situation with him. Obviously, if he wants to be back, um, you know, that's something John's going to have to work out. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you are telling the guy to get out, uh, but certainly some of the ways that he didn't show up this year, especially coming back in his second season, were, were concerning when you think about what you would need him to be if he returns. All right, last guy is Caleb Foster. Duke played 36 games this season. Foster played in 27 of them. Obviously had that uh, season-ending injury there at the end of the year. Played about 25 minutes a game for the Duke basketball team. What does next season kind of look like for him? Is there a reality that he's back, or what's what's going on? Yeah, I absolutely think there's a reality that he's back. You know, I was, I, you know, in some ways, as much as Duke would have loved to have had him in the NCAA tournament, the fact that he wasn't able to play, you know, the last three, four weeks of the season makes it so that it probably enhances the the chances that he's back um just because he didn't necessarily get to show over a consistent stretch what he was capable of but you know as a guy who again you have to look through the lens of roster construction and you can't do it with the long-term lens anymore you just have to do it immediately and for john next year what do you need you need shooting you need shooting around those two big guys around cooper flag and mall walk and what does caleb foster provide he provides shooting he's got a moon ball it's beautiful um, he's also a guy who had shown the ability to be a pure scorer. He's shown the ability when he was at the high school level to be a high assist guy. Um, and we know that he can do it at the highest level because he did it against Michigan state. So we've seen him have those sorts of dominant games. So to me, I think Caleb Foster, you know, if he's, if he does choose to come back, um, you know, I don't think it's a situation where he's again, the, he, it, it was such a limited sample size this year that it would be hard for him to go pro. I don't think that that would be, 
capitalizing on what he could be if he comes back and has the season that he could for a national title contender. Um, kind of thinking like him leaving now to me would be kind of like Trevor Keels where you knew that he was good. You knew there was something there, but he probably didn't give himself enough of a, a, a runway to get the draft situation that he needed. I think Caleb's another situation where like that, where he could come back, really help himself, really help this team, um, you know, start at one of those guard spots, one, two, three. Um, he's going to have to get better. He's going to have to get better as a defender. He's going to have to really lean into some of his athleticism. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think it would be in Duke's best interest to make him a high priority coming back next season. So intrigued to see what that guard situation is going to look like this next season and uh, Duke players making decisions going into next year. One thing we do know for certain, Cooper Flag is heading to Durham, and that's a pretty good thing for Duke. One more brief timeout, and then we'll wrap it up with a little more time. Our pal Brendan Marks of The Athletic hanging out with us here today on Locked On Blue Devils. All right, Locked On Blue Devils is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel, of course, is America's number one sports book. It's a great time of year with the Major League Baseball season getting started. The NBA and NHL are so close to finishing up their regular seasons. And then we'll also be able to tell you about the opportunities to bet each and every day at FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's right, $150 win or lose bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe secure and easy to use the network letting people know about futures odds and of course we've discussed this throughout the week but at FanDuel Duke has the greatest odds to cut down the nets for the 2024 national title what are you waiting for go ahead and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Wrap it up today's episode with Brendan Marks of The Athletic here today. Brendan, before we get into kind of next season, uh, take this opportunity, if you will, tell folks about your work and how they can get plugged in. Yeah, absolutely. So all my stories um, on Duke, on the ACC, on college basketball as a whole, they go up at theathletic.com. Um, if you're not checking us out by now, I don't know what you're doing. I think we have the best college basketball. We we do. We have the most comprehensive college basketball staff in the entire world. Um, we have the most resources. We have the most people covering the sport full time. And then obviously, if you join, join and subscribe to The Athletic, you get – NBA, you get NFL, you get college football, you get NHL, MLB, you get European soccer, you get golf, you get masters, you get whatever you want. So, um, you know, come check us out over there and on Twitter at Brendan R. Marks. Um, I, I try to engage with people at, at least as best as I can, but um, all my stuff goes up there as well. I try and share it all out on Twitter yeah. as well. Known for sharing some airport thoughts from time to time as you're traveling so frequently there on Twitter and comments on stories happening across the sports world. So, again, Brendan R. Marks on X. Go and check it out. Uh, all the great work over there. So uh, we're talking about Cooper Flag and your work. You had a great profile of him throughout the course of his senior season. Uh, within this past week or two, he's been a McDonald's All-American. He's won Chipotle Nationals. And now he really kind of gets to dig his feet in and, and get ready to be a college basketball player. I mentioned our friends on the network here over at FanDuel already giving Duke really good odds to win the whole thing next year. And I would have to think Cooper Flag is a big reason why that could be the case. Cooper Flag is a huge reason why. I mean, I, I, I've said this a couple of times. He's the best high school player I've ever seen. Uh, you know, he's better than Brandon Ingram was in high school. He's better than Paolo was in high school. Um, you know, he, he's, he is one of the best high school players that I've – I ever seen. I mean, he just is. I mean, the facts, what he can do at his size, um, the roles that he's been put in, you know, there have been times when he has to play point guard, especially on the grassroots circuit for his AAU team, and he has to be the primary ball handler. Okay, cool. No problem. Um, you know, the way that he can dribble, the way that he finishes inside, it, it, it's fascinating, like talking to his high school coaches. If he drives and finishes, um, even against the, an elite, you know, top 25 high school team, you know, his coaches will criticize him sometimes and say, you know, you didn't get the ball low enough or you didn't keep it tight enough to your chest or you went up too early. And they say that not through the lens of, hey, you just scored on a high schooler. They say it through the lens of you're not going to be able to get, do that against Jimmy Butler nine months from now. <laughs> um, like those are the expectations with him. And, you know, I think especially defensively, he is the best defensive player at his position that I've probably seen, you know, at, for his age, um, college or high school. The number of shots that he blocks 
Obviously, he has a, a crazy highlight reel, but I think when we think of blocks, a lot of the time we think about him as you know being in the paint or being as a secondary defender and coming over. I'm, I'm talking him as a primary defender from the three point line, blocking three pointers. It is crazy his timing is in, and anticipation. I mean, it's it's bonkers. Um, his three point shot has come around really well. Uh, it, there really isn't anything he can't do. So you put him together with Kaman Malwalk, who's at the Nike Hoot Summit right now, competing for the world roster, um, seven foot one South Sudanese center. I, I, I've said this a couple of times. I don't know if I've said it here, JJ, but when Kaman committed to Duke, I had a scout text me immediately and say, these two guys are going to be the most heavily scouted pair of college teammates since Andrew Wiggins and Joel Embiid in 2014, more than Zion wow. and RJ, more than anybody else. Um, they both could be number one in the draft next year. So those two guys, yes, they are the foundation of why Duke is going to be one of the preseason favorites again next season. Um, at the athletic, we had Duke number one in our way too early top 25. Um, but again, because those guys are going to be so good and so dominant right out of the gate, they do also play a huge role in the roster building picture because you have to complement them. And so that's why I think it makes, you know, again, we mentioned Mark Mitchell's already in the portal. Christian Reeves is in the portal. Um, those guys understand the situation in the front court next season. It's going to influence that. It's also going to influence the guards and, and the skill sets of the guards, especially uh, that John both brings back, brings in and potentially targets in the portal. Just in terms of quantity, it's a really large recruiting class that's coming in, right? And that's going to take up six scholarships. A year from now, we're still thinking Mackenzie Mbaco is set to play his freshman season at Duke, right? So the top two guys are headliners. That's crazy to think about. NBA perspective, no other two teammates are sought after as much as these two guys are. But let's look past them. The other four freshmen – I mean, is there a real path to playing time, you think, for those guys? Can they make an impact they want on campus? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think especially for a guy like Isaiah Evans, um, it, being able to shoot the ball at a high rate, um, he in the times that I have seen him play live, uh, I've probably seen him play four or five times live, um, he has been either sensational. I mean, I saw one grassroots game where he made six threes in the first half, um, <laughs> or he's been a little more streaky. And so I think finding consistency there is going to be big for him. But again, we're talking about you want to be able to build around and have shooting around these two guys. Isaiah brings that. He brings shooting. He brings size. He brings somebody who can do different things on the perimeter. Um, we just saw UConn, which won the national title, didn't have a starter below six foot four. You know, if Jeremy Roach comes back, that wouldn't be the case for Duke. But the rest of the roster, we can we're talking about potentially having it be super size. So, I think Isaiah Evans. I think there's a pathway to playing time for him. Um, Patrick Ngangba, obviously coming in, like you know that Mal Walk is going to be the guy. But you know, he Patrick was dealing with a foot injury most of the season. Didn't necessarily play as much as I think a lot of people would have liked. As much as I'm sure he would have liked, um, but still comes in with a really high pedigree, strong reputation. Are there minutes for him in the front court? I would say probably as long as, you know, health permitting. Um, and then maybe a guy like Con Nupple on the wing. I mean, again, if you can score, if you can shoot, that's that's what this roster needs. That's what John wants. And, um, you know, we saw how important that was for this year's roster, um, even to the nth degree next season. So I think there is a pathway to playing time for those guys, certainly. Um, and again, you know, I, I hate to beat the dead horse, but it does have to be viewed through the lens of those two guys because they are going to be options 1A and 1B next season. Excited to see it all come together again in the next week or two. We'll have several more decisions being made uh, in regards to this past year's Duke team, and then they kind of look at the transfer portal and see who else could join them. We'll see if, if Duke can get all six freshmen to actually show up on campus and plan to be a part of uh, this team this upcoming season as we saw that curveball last season. And then I'd be remiss also if this wasn't mentioned. We saw a big coaching change take place, a little unexpected in the sport with Coach Cal leaving Lexington and heading down to Fayetteville. This past or this time a year ago, Emil Jefferson is still very much in the fold for the Duke staff, and then the Boston Celtics come calling. I think it'd be great for the Duke team if there can be a level of consistency on the coaching staff, but even those things aren't always a guarantee, Brendan. Yeah. You know, I think obviously like, look, and, and again, in some ways, the fact that Duke maybe didn't have the season, a lot of people expected, it kind of helps you in that respect because, you know, uh, if, if Duke has another season where they're in the final four and they've got a top five defense and they win the ACC and all that, like is Jay Lucas getting a head coaching job? 
you know, are, are some of these guys getting other opportunities? You Certainly know, I, deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he will get that at some point here in the very near future. Um, but being able to have him come around for another year, especially defensively with Jay, what Jay will do with Cooper and come on. I mean, I mean, I think it'll look, I think defensively Duke will look much more like John's first roster than they did this season. Um, and then, you know, obviously I think, I think Emmanuel Dildy probably doesn't get enough credit for the job he did this season, you know, coming in, different level of basketball, different level of recruiting. Um, I think that he's acquitted himself well to the staff, especially by the end of the year. He was actually on my flight out to the final four. Um, hilariously enough, we were both checking our bags at 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, you know, so I, it was good to see him. And uh, I, I think, again, John has had so much turnover. He's had so many moving pieces and things. Um, you know, if you can get all those guys back, I mean, Rachel Baker, Mike Shroggy, you know, like the, it's not, it's more than just Will Avery. It's more than just those three primary assistants, but having some consistency is always a, a key thing. Um, especially, you know, given some of the guys that they have coming in and, and again, like what's possible. Those are not just FanDuel odds. Duke is in very, very strong position next season. Again, they're going to be preseason top, whatever. Um, and they should be with the guys that they're having coming in. Excited to see it all come together and follow your work along the way. Thank you so much for the time today, Brandon. This has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. I appreciate you, JJ. I'm sure we'll do it again soon, and I'll have been woefully wrong. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Another visit coming from our pal, Brendan Marks. Super grateful that he took time out of his schedule to chat with us here today and recap the season that was and look ahead a little bit. That'll do it for our show here today. Thank you so much for your support. As always, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star rating and written review on the podcast platform. That'll do it. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.